A few years ago, a film came out called Naked Among Wolves, based on a, a novel, and it was actually a, made into a movie a long time before that as well. But it's set during the end of World War II in a concentration camp. And one of the main characters in this film is responsible to sort through suitcases uh, of recently arrived prisoners. And he's supposed to, to keep what's valuable in those suitcases for the German soldiers and then to throw away everything else. And while he's opening these suitcases, he finds a, a surprise. There's a little boy inside one of them. His family uh, put this little boy in the suitcase to, to save him from German soldiers and hope that maybe he would end up somewhere safe, but he actually ended up in a concentration camp. So this man uh, tells his friends about the boy and they make it their mission together to, to save that little boy's life, to make sure that, that nothing bad happens to him. Um, it gives them a new purpose while they're there inside that concentration camp going through really difficult things. It's very important to have a mission. Very important. Um, another survivor of the Holocaust, a man named Viktor Frankl, he... He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, and this is one of the quotations from that book. Those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Viktor Frankl noticed something about prisoners in concentration camps, that the ones who had a mission and a, person, a purpose and a reason to keep going, they were able to endure some very, very difficult circumstances while they were in, in these camps. But the prisoners who didn't have a purpose and who didn't have a mission were easily succumbed to hopelessness and despair. Uh, Frankel noticed they were often the first people either to get really sick or to die there in prison camps. So it's uh, really, really important to have a mission, a purpose in our lives. And that's what we heard Jesus talking about in, in the New Testament reading from Luke 24. We heard God, uh, true, we, we heard uh, the true God, true man in, in one person telling his people what their mission was, giving, giving his church her purpose. And that was to uh, be his witnesses in the world, proclaiming repentance unto the forgiveness of sins. And if you noticed, Jesus had to do something with his disciples in order for them to sort of understand this. Did you, did you notice what it said Jesus did? He opened their minds. And he did that by, by telling them what the Bible was really all about. <laughs> it was a book about him. See, this is a mission that we would never pursue on our own. It's a mission that has to pursue us. And that's why here in worship at St. John's, God's word is sort of the, the foundation of our services because Jesus has to do the same thing for us. He has to open our minds so that we understand and embrace this mission that he's given to us. And a question may, may be, why does Jesus need to do that? Why does he need to, to open our minds? <clears throat> when it comes to pursuing a mission, you and I have no problem doing that. Every single day, when we get out of bed, we are giving ourselves over to a purpose. We are committing ourselves to some sort of mission. And I guess you could say whatever drives you in life, whatever, you know, whatever you're committed to and pour yourself into, you could say that that is your mission. That is your life's mission. And there are lots of different examples of what people have as their missions. Uh, one example would be finances. This is just a very obvious example that um, when our main goal in life is finances, then we, we see our lives, our existence, as being uh, working to make a living and to provide a comfortable existence for ourselves and for our families. When we see our main purpose in life as, as primarily financial, we, we will use money to accumulate lots of things, but then when it comes to sharing what we have, it'll be very difficult for us. Or we may give, but it's only on the condition that the money is used well and that it's used right. 
When our primary goal in life is, is financial, then we're going to experience very little joy and, and a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry. Sometimes our mission in life may be our families. When our primary goal in life is, to, uh, is that our families stay together and that they appear to be happy, uh, we will control our spouses, our children, in order that they meet with our expectations and sort of fit into what we want them to be. We'll, we'll take pictures and post them of, of our family looking really happy when the truth was we were probably yelling at each other five seconds before we took the picture. <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, that's when, when your, your main purpose in life is, is to, to have this idea of a hap, happy family, you'll, you'll sort of hide the details that, that you don't want other people to know about of your family. Anything that may make it look like there's actually sin in your family. And, and you also find it really, really hard to invite people who are not your flesh and blood uh, into your lives. Uh, another mission, another purpose that we sometimes look for is leisure, recreation. I suppose if, if leisure or recreation becomes our main goal in life, then we're going to talk a lot about how life is all about having fun. That would be kind of the theme of our lives. And we'll find it very difficult to commit to anything that involves sacrifice or that involves any real work. Or if our mission in life is to be perceived as a good person, if our main goal in life is that others think well of us, that we do our acts of righteousness for others to see, then we'll probably end up living a double life. We will end up portraying an image of ourselves in public that we want other people to believe, but then in secret we'll hide and, and, and actually live a life that we don't want anybody to know about. It'll be a, a double life when our main mission is that other people perceive us to be good. See, we, I, could, I could list a, a variety of other things, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that we have no problem... <laughs> pursuing a mission in our lives. We, that just comes naturally to us. The minute we step foot out of bed in the morning, we are giving ourselves over to a purpose, over to a mission that we hope will bring us meaning and peace and fulfillment. And to whatever degree that we feel like failures, to whatever degree we're experiencing excessive sorrow and uh, hopelessness and whatever else, it might, depression, depression, um, to that degree, we can figure out what our mission in life had become because we failed at it. It's kind of like the disciples. when, um, After Jesus first had been and crucified and buried, and they, they sort of didn't see any reason really for existing anymore. Their mission in life may have been that Jesus would, would show his glory and they would be right there when he did it, uh, and when that didn't happen, they felt like life was no longer worth living. And they, they sat in a room together and pouted and didn't talk to one another and just lived like a bunch of, of losers. That's what they did. So to just think about it for yourself. In, in what areas of your life are you discouraged right now? In what areas of your life do you feel like a failure? In what areas of your life have you lost hope? Maybe that's what had become your mission in life. The question is, is that mission God's mission? Is that mission God's mission for you? I've shared parts of this book with you before here in worship services called the Jesus Storybook Bible. It's... Um, not the whole Bible, uh, but it's a, a lady who retells many of the accounts from Scripture, and she made one of her goals that she would take abstract ideas sometimes that come up in the Bible and put them into language that children could understand. One of those abstract ideas would be one that we heard Jesus talk about today. It's still something that people are very confused about. It's the word, the word Repentance. What does it mean when people say repent? 
In this book, the author wrote, uh, whenever God was going to, his me- he sent his messengers to tell people to repent, she put it, she put it this way, um, that they were going to tell people not to run from God, but to run to him. Because he can't stop loving you. And he longs to forgive you, and he longs to have you close to his heart. Don't run from God, run to him. Isn't that a great way to summarize what repentance is? See, the thing is, God's always had a mission for the whole world. His his mission has always been the same. It's it's that we would know him through the, the guy that's right on the front of that Bible, that we would know God through Jesus Christ, his son, who, as we sang, is the author of all creation, and yet he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And he fulfilled his mission, not first by entering into glory, but by being crucified in weakness, by being crucified for you and for me, and for all people. He is the God. He is the God who forgives his enemies. And he's the God who forgives you. And the God who forgives me. Past, present, future, everything has been nailed to the cross in Jesus Christ. And he's the God who raises his son up, his servant, to new life again and gives him all authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus has defeated and destroyed hell. He has destroyed the power of Satan. I mean, the the Bible says he led captive uh, his enemies. There there is nothing that, that the powers of evil can do to separate you from the love of God. So don't run from him. Run to him. Repent and believe the good news. God can't stop loving you. Those men that I talked about earlier in that film, they, uh, they found a new reason to keep going in a concentration camp. And it was the life of a little boy. And that meant that they needed to work together and they needed to, uh, to talk together and plan and strategize and be accountable to one another to carry out that mission. Sounds a little bit like the church. Our mission is different, but the beautiful thing about the mission Jesus has given to us, his body, is that we don't try to carry it out as individuals. Rather, Jesus carries out his mission through us as we work together. <clears throat> Does anybody recognize this man it's in the news recently? Okay. Robert F. Smith is his name billionaire who gave a commencement speech at Morehouse College in Atlanta. And during his commencement speech, he made a very surprising announcement. He promised to pay off the student loan debts of everyone in that graduating class. And it's, it's funny to sort of <laughs> watch the YouTube video. There's one guy right behind him. He's just trying to, trying to understand if this guy is serious or not. But... The joy that it brought to that class um, was pretty amazing. See, he said that he wanted them to go out into their, their, the field, wanted them to go out into the world, not carrying a heavy burden with them, not weighed down with all sorts of uh, obligations and expectations they needed to meet, but to go out in freedom into the world so that they could serve and, and be Uh, be useful members of their communities. All those those people in that graduating class, they probably came from different backgrounds. 
They may have had different uh, amounts of debt to pay off. They had different majors. They're headed into different career fields. But they all received the same gift. Someone else, at great cost to himself, completely pardoned their debts. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? I mean, we would call that grace in the church. Lower G, lowercase g, grace. Not the same as what God shows us, but isn't that the same thing that God has done for everybody here? Uh, we say in the creed, we believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Same baptism that all of us received. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one holy Christian and apostolic church. And uh, as Jesus ascended into heaven, did you notice how he, he made visible the cost? How everybody could see the nail marks in his hands and his feet, the, the victory marks, really? of what Jesus did to buy you and me to be his own forever. All those people who were there at Bethany, um, they all, there were different genders. There were people of different ages, different backgrounds, different abilities and skill sets, and yet they all received the same blessing from the same Lord just as it is here this morning. As far as I can tell, there are two things that need to continue to happen here at St. John's for us as a congregation to carry out the mission that Jesus has given to us. Luke tells us that the early church, early believers, that they, after Jesus ascended back into heaven, that they stayed together and they were filled with great joy and they praised God. That means that they didn't withdraw from the world into their own little communities where they all uh, stayed together and had everything in common and tried to be different, totally separated from the world. It means that they didn't try to carry out the, the mission Jesus gave them as individuals, but rather they encouraged and met together and proclaimed the wonders of God. They proclaimed Christ crucified, Christ risen, and they relied on each other. They looked at each other as co-workers rather than competition. That's the first thing that, that needs to continue to happen at St. John's for us to carry out our mission. The second is that uh, these early believers waited for the gift that the Father had promised. They waited for the gift the Father had promised. It's hard to wait, isn't it? It's a hard thing to do. Hundreds of years before this, God sent the prophet Zechariah to encourage the Israelites as they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. And um, God told Zechariah to tell the people this message. He said, not by strength nor by power, but by my spirit. In other words, God was saying, you guys are not going to accomplish this mission by relying on your own wisdom, your own abilities, your own strength, and, and carefully using your youth and vigor to get this accomplished. It's going to be by my ruach. That's the, the Hebrew word. I just like that sound. It's going to be by my spirit, my breath, my energy. That's how this is going to get done. And so what that means is that uh, when, when congregations, when they're only able to talk about what they're accomplishing and what they're doing and talk about themselves, then, then they don't really have anything to say to the world anymore. When, when that's all congregations can talk about is themselves and what they're accomplishing, then, then we really don't have anything of in, eternal value to tell the world. But when we wait for the gift that the Father has promised, the Spirit, he guides us into all truth. And it's, it's what the Spirit is going to do in a few moments as he brings us up to this magnificent meal that Jesus gave to his church. As the Apostle Paul says, whenever you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then we really have something to say to the world. 
That's a message that really matters. That God has in Christ reconciled the whole world to himself, not counting people's sins against him, them. So those two things, gathering together and proclaiming the wonders of God, relying on one another, and second, waiting, waiting for the gift that the Father has promised. Jesus has given us everything we need as he blesses us out into our mission, our mission. And he has promised to be with us to the end of the age. He's promised to take things we call bad and turn them around and use them for good. He has promised to to work in us what is good and pleasing to him. And that's why in a couple minutes we're going to sing. We're going to sing together with all the saints and hosts of heaven. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's what we'll sing again when we see Jesus with our own eyes. Amen.